slowing and stopping trains so that they don't derail. Um, this is actually a chip manufacturing robot. This is actually in Japan. Um, very, very sensitive piece of equipment, very expensive piece of equipment. And knowing a few seconds before the shaking starts, so you can actually put it down on the floor so it doesn't fall over. Usually they operate um, held up on air mattresses to isolate them from everyday vibrations. You just need to put it down on the floor so it doesn't fall over. It's as simple as that. And you just save yourselves $10 million. So these kinds of applications, stopping planes and landing, of course, as you know, we lost 300 feet of the Oakland Airport runway in the Loma Prieta earthquake. You really don't want a plane landing around the time of the earthquake or immediately after the earthquake before people have realized um, what is going on. And then the third category is situation awareness, and this is the emergency response um, piece that uh, one person mentioned. And so anybody who has infrastructure over a large area, knowing what's going on before the shaking starts just allows you to initiate the response before you potentially lose communications. And that's true for emergency response, but it's also true for things like utilities, power lines, phone systems, gas lines, things like that. Um, so these are all, all good uses of earthquake early warning. And so even though this is a demonstration system, we've been reaching out to some of these groups to try and work with them to make sure, first of all, that what we're producing is what they want, that it's true that earthquake early warning is actually useful for them. And to get feedback on, on, on how our system should be improved. And so BART has always been at the forefront of this, and they've been a great advocate. And um, they have a director who, who's advocating for this. And, and this, is, I mean, this is what he would tell you if he was standing here. John McPartland is his name. Um, and the first thing that they want to do, of course, is automatically slow and stop the trains. And the reason they want to do that is kind of straightforward, but I want to illustrate it. So imagine, first of all, one of those big, um, the big buses that drive around Berkeley, you know, the Vendi buses, right? Imagine one of those buses driving around. So in rush hour, when it's packed full of people, you can get almost 100 people on those buses, okay? So now imagine that bus going along the highway at 70 miles an hour, going along towards the maze, for example, where you know, the highways are all raised up. And it just doesn't take the corner. It doesn't go around the curve. It just careers straight off the side of the highway at 70 miles an hour. You can kind of imagine what's going to happen to the 100 people on that bus. Okay? Now imagine you have 10 of those buses all going along back to back at 70 miles an hour, and none of them make the turn. They all career off the, off the highway. So that is, in fact, a BART train. Right? A BART train during rush hour is a 10-car train. There's about 100 people in each of the train cars. Normal operating speed is 70 miles an hour. And so if you have an earthquake and you damage the track, um, you, and there's an you know, increased likelihood of derailment, then that entire train could career off the tracks at 70 miles an hour. And you can imagine what's going to happen to the 1,000 people that are on that track. Obviously, there's going to be a significant number of fatalities. There was a train um, uh, in New York that derailed at about 70 miles an hour. I, I hope I'm remembering these numbers right. There was, uh, there was fewer than 100 people on board, but there were 10 fatalities. We would be talking about hundreds of fatalities. Okay? During rush hour, there are 64 trains operating. At any given moment in time, somewhere between 40 and 45 of those trains are traveling at 70 miles an hour. And now you have an earthquake. You can see why BART is keen to slow and stop those trains if there's an earthquake. And in fact, I don't know if you know this, but the um, BART train system is completely computer controlled. You see a person at the front of the BART train, and they have two responsibilities. The first is to close the doors before the, station leaves, before the train leaves the station, and the second is they have an emergency stop button. That is it. They don't do anything else in terms of train control. Everything else is controlled from the central operations uh, center, which is the late narrative station. So if they get the warning in that center, they can automatically slow and stop all of the trains. It takes them 24 seconds to bring a train from 70 miles an hour to a complete stop at the normal deceleration rate. Okay? So that, that is their plan. The second piece of what they want to use early warning for is actually to do with post earthquake response. Um, I can't remember. Did we talk about Katrina this year or not? <laughs> yes. Okay. So you all remember the pictures of um, 10, about 10,000 people were trapped at the Superdome after Hurricane Katrina. They were trapped there for more than five days because there was just no way to get them out. It was a horrible situation. Okay. You, um, and they were trapped there for five days. So BART has just spent $2 billion retrofitting its tracks. And the idea, the intent here is after an earthquake, we can use the BART system to move people out of the damage zone. So we don't have a repeat of the Superdome situation. Now that's great, but we can only do that if there aren't derailed trains blocking everything. So again, having early warning to reduce the likelihood of derailed trains also increases the likelihood that we can use BART after a, a big earthquake to move people away from the damage zone. Okay. So there's this double piece, which is why BART is using it. Okay, so they were our first adopter. They've actually automated the process of slowing and stopping the train, so they automatically slow and stop trains. Their system activated in the Napa earthquake. Of course, the Napa earthquake occurred at 3.20 in the morning, so there were no trains running, so there were no trains that were stopped. But had trains been running, they would have been stopped automatically by the system. Okay, the second group I already mentioned a few times, the city of San Francisco, multiple agencies. Um, right now, um, they get the alerts in the 911 center. Um, they are working to, to notify firehouses to, to open the doors, and they're talking about a variety um, of other uses right now as well. I'm going to keep going. Google, well, <laughs> Google gobbles up everything. It's very straightforward, and that includes our early warning message. But the crisis response team is using it. Of course, they're not allowed to pass the warning on to anybody right now, but they are receiving the warning. Um, they actually use it in their operation center, so they know what's going on across California in their operation center. And they're also planning on using it to generate a startup and things like that. Somebody's mentioned data centers and things like that. So, of course, that's one of the things that Google is planning on using. I'm sure they're also thinking about how they might push the warning out publicly when it becomes a public system. Uh, the UC police, um, sorry, UC, uh, Berkeley is using it. The police already have a code red notification. Whenever there's, an earth, whenever there's a warning, they have a threshold of how strong the shaking is going to be. They push out a code red notification to all their personnel, not just the police, but all the other piece, uh, personnel associated with the um, hazard response and, and things like that, so people know that the shaking is coming. And the reason for that is so that the police officers themselves can be ready for the shaking. They can personally steal themselves for the shaking, so they are less likely to be injured and then are able to help in the recovery immediately after the earthquake. The data center is actually also working on making use of it, the hazmat teams, the chemistry labs, group of possible users here on the Berkeley campus. And then, so those are just some of the groups I wanted to emphasize because they're the ones who are most actively thinking about um, how to make use of it. A variety of emergency response groups across this is a statewide project that includes Los Angeles. Cal OES is the statewide emergency response. Other private sector companies, Southern California Edison, Boyd Gaming, they run a lot of the casinos in Nevada. Quite why they want to know about it is not clear to me, but I suspect money's involved. Uh, Amgen is a biotech company um, uh, in California. Metrolink is in, in LA. Various other groups um, that are, are thinking about making use of it. Okay, so what did this look like uh, for the Napa event? So this is the location of the Napa event. What's shown here is the amount of warning time that people had. Again, the warning you get is a function of how far you are away from the epicenter. And so the, the Berkeley police got the five seconds warning. Uh, Bart, well, the station got an eight seconds warning. The warning was pushed out eight seconds before the S-wave arrived in downtown Oakland. Of course, their system is over a much larger area. Um, city of San Francisco, nine seconds, and Google down here um, got a 20 seconds uh, warning. Okay, so that was actual performance of
the question was, is this the first time that this has been used? So we've been detecting earthquakes and pushing out alerts for about two years. So we detect earthquakes greater than about magnitude three across the state. So typically two or three times a week, there's an earthquake that we detect and we push out the warning because you don't expect people to respond or react when there's a magnitude three earthquake. So in that sense, the system is being exercised multiple times per week. Um, this is, of course, the most significant event because it was the most damaging event. I'm going to show you one more event, though, in a few minutes from Southern California, which is also a significant event. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, this is just running all the time. So it's not only going to tell you about the main shock, it will also tell you about after shock. Any other questions? Okay, so this blind zone is because, first of all, energy has to get up to the surface and be detected, and secondly, it does take us a little bit of time uh, to do the calculation. So the alert was actually issued 5.1 seconds after the earthquake began at depth, and 3.3 seconds after the P wave arrived at the closest station. So the system processing time did take 3.3 seconds. So that's something that we could try and reduce, and as you'll see in a minute, we can, in fact, already reduce it. Okay, so here's another earthquake, just to show you. This wasn't a lucky fluke that we managed to detect an earthquake. Here's the sort of next, next most significant event in California over the course of the next earthquake. This is the Lahambra earthquake that occurred this spring uh, in LA. Um, so this was in March 28th. It's a magnitude 5.1 earthquake. So of course, it didn't really do any damage. Um, but it, uh, most people across Los Angeles felt, felt the shaking. Um, and in this particular case, uh, we issued an alert four seconds after the origin time. If you remember, in the last one, it was 5.1 seconds. This one was actually a little faster, which means that the blind zone um, is a little smaller. So, so LA, this is Los Angeles. All of this sort of gray area is the flat piece, the urbanized piece. So if you were within this blind zone, you could not have had a warning. But if you were outside the blind zone, you could have had a warning. Everybody in Los Angeles felt this earthquake. So what that means is, um, is that if, we, if this was a public system, most people in Los Angeles um, would be able to, to get a warning. Okay, so I have a little another video clip that I'm going to show you. Earthquake struck Los Angeles last night, rattling nerves and shelves. The quake registered as a magnitude 5.1, centered 20 miles southeast of LA. There aren't any reports of major damage this morning, but the earthquake broke water mains and gas lines, cut power to thousands of people, and made a mess of homes and stores. The quake caused this rock slide that knocked a car on its roof, causing minor injuries to the people inside. Dozens of aftershocks followed the main quake, including one during a news conference held by the U.S. Geological Service. So the early warning system, four seconds. And now we're having an aftershock. Okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, estimated magnitude right. and, and, X. Yeah. and the intensity is one, which is basically no shaking, and obviously we didn't shake. Okay. 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 So obviously, the, uh, what you saw in the video was an aftershock, a very small aftershock of magnitude 2.5 that just happened to occur while they were holding the press conference. Even better, they were even talking about the warning from the, the main shock when this particular aftershock occurred. Also, I'd like to point out, this was actually the press room, press conference room at Caltech. The two people you saw there talking about this were USGS scientists. However, every single earthquake warning that went out in Los Angeles that day came from Berkeley, not from Caltech. So we're very <laughs> proud of that, uh, that particular achievement. Okay, so, and there were other earthquakes. The point here is that we're now doing this on a routine basis, okay? Again, this is not some hypothetical. We're actually doing this. We're pushing warnings out. We could make the system better. We could make it a little bit faster, but we've proven um, the technology. And so now the discussion is how do we take this demonstration system and turn it into a full blown uh, public uh, earthquake early warning system. So California actually has a law that says California, Californians should have an earthquake early warning system. Okay? And this was legislation that was introduced by Senator Alex Padilla last year at the beginning of 2013. Um, it worked its way through um, the, uh, the legislative process in Sacramento over the course of the year. I don't know how many of you, uh, how familiar you are with the legislation process. I am now very familiar with it, having uh, participated in the process of this legislation being passed. And it is absolute sausage making. It is unbelievable how Sacramento works. Um, it had to be passed by both the Senate and by the Assembly. And I can tell you that in both cases, when it was both first at the Senate, it was introduced by uh, Senator Padilla, um, we were basically under the impression that this legislation was dead, dead in the water. And then 24 hours later, they had a vote on the floor of the Senate, and it had passed unanimously. And then the process begins in the Assembly, and there's all of these hearings and briefings and behind-the-scenes chats <laughs> with people. Again, this legislation was dead. And 24 hours later, suddenly it had been taken to the floor of the Assembly and was passed unanimously. It's really quite incredible how this works. And then the Senate, uh, sorry, the Governor did then sign it into law. And so as of September last year, um, California has an earthquake early warning uh, law, which is great. What does this actually mean? Okay, so the, whoops, so the law requires that the Governor's Office of Emergency Services to develop a comprehensive statewide earthquake early warning system. That's good. It requires them to develop standards for the system and a mechanism to make sure it's going to work. It is working. That's good. Here's the catch. They also have to identify funding. So the reason that this passed unanimously is because there was no money promised to build the system. So it just says, yes, we should build the system, and the Government Office of Emergency Services should identify funding, but it didn't provide any funding. And even worse than that, it explicitly excludes the use of the general fund, which basically means money that's come from taxes. So right now, the California Office of Emergency Services um, is working on both designing a system and trying to identify sources of funding, but as of yet, there is no funding. So we will have to see what, what actually happens. There's also been activity in Washington, D.C. to try and build an earthquake early warning system. It's sort of not something that's difficult for most legislators to get behind. But more specifically, no legislator wants to be caught voting against a public early warning system, because then if we do have an earthquake and we don't have a system, then they're caught, right? So legislators don't want to vote against it, but at the same time, um, it's very difficult for them to actually commit funding. So the House Natural Resources Committee had a hearing on this earlier this year, June of this year, uh, titled A Whole Lot of Shaking, an Examination of America's Earthquake Early Warning System Development um, and Implementations. Um, some quotes, some of my favorite quotes from the legislators during this hearing. Lamborn, who's a Republican and chair of the committee, the lack of focus on investment in early warning is a deep concern. It is so obvious to me that we have to find the money to do this. Great. Lowenthal, Democrat in California, when we prepare, lives are saved. An earthquake early warning system is just another common sense investment that can save lives and mitigate damages. DeFazio from Oregon, it's pretty darn pathetic when countries like Romania, Mexico, and Mongolia are doing more to protect their citizens than the United States of America. Mongolia has an earthquake early warning system. So all of these people are obviously, everybody, in fact, sat around, was in favor of building an earthquake early warning system. What they cannot agree on is how it should be paid for. And the short of it is that Democrats think that more money should be spent and more money should be given to the U.S. Geologic Survey to build an early warning system. Republicans think that the EPA should be defunded and that money could be used to build an earthquake early warning system. So again, we're, we're stuck um, because they can't agree on where the money should come from to do this. So what should a, a system look like? Well, it's meant to be a public-private partnership. Um, the idea is that we use the seismic networks that are running with parallel processing centers statewide to generate alerts. That, of course, is exactly what I just showed you a few moments ago in terms of how the, the demonstration system works. And then, of course, we need multiple paths. Somebody asked about how do you get the warning. Well, this app that I showed you is just one way you can get the warning.
Um, this what, alert will get pushed out through the emergency alert system, so that's like the, the way, the same way you get Android alerts. So you would get it on your phone through that system, although this is actually a pretty slow system, it takes multiple seconds, so that's not the best way of doing it. But then there's also all of these private sector companies who are interested to have networks that can combine, provide data to the system, um, and also have their own dedicated warning systems in order to maximize uh, how the system would work. So the whole point here is that there would be this public private partnership um, to deliver the warnings uh, and improve the warnings for, for everybody. Okay, what does it cost? So to build the system and run it for the first five years is $80 million, $80 million. Okay? So that's not a huge amount of money. It works out to be about $2 per, per person. Um, and so that's what it will cost to build and operate the system for the first five years. Um, okay, so why should we invest $80 million? The reason that we should invest $80 million, um, maybe it was my comment about the Republicans. Um, why would we invest $80 million? Well, first of all, investing that money would make the system faster. Um, and so, in fact, if we invested this, this, this money to make the system faster, the blind zone would shrink from 16 kilometers, which is what it was during the past earthquake, to 8 kilometers. And so, in fact, if we had made the investment, this comes back to this question, we're going to do this now or after the next big earthquake. If we had made that investment to improve the system, then, in fact, Napa would have received a warning. Napa is no longer in the blind zone. Um, so that's why we need the funding to add additional stations to make the system faster um, and to make the system more robust. So that, that's the reason that this investment is needed. When we ask, you know, do people really want early warning? I mean, it's pretty obvious to me that the answer is yes. But in Japan, they had a warning system. They put out a warning in the Tohoku Oki earthquake. I mean, they did a survey. They did a survey asking people about a year after the Tohoku Oki earthquake um, about whether early warning is useful. And they had four options. Is it the answer, yes, it's useful. On balance, it's useful. On balance, it's useless or it's useless. They did a survey in the Tohoku region of that big earthquake and then nationwide. And you can see the vast majority of people think earthquake early warning is, is useful. Why is it useful? Interestingly, the three top answers, the biggest response is to trigger actions, that's slowing and stopping trains. Then these other two options, one is to protect yourself, that's getting under a sturdy table, but equally popular response is just to be ready for shaking. So now you know what's coming, you know there's about to be shaking, you can mentally be ready for that shaking, and that makes it much, uh, much less of a uh, significant event to, to be through because you know the shaking's coming, you know what's going on, you know it's going to stop. Okay, so the summary so far in terms of our efforts to implement earthquake early warning in the US, well, earthquakes are a real threat, you, you guys know that, I'm not sure you've seen this number, but FEMA estimates that in the US as a whole, the West Coast rather, $4 billion per lo in losses per year when you annualize it, when you average the losses out, it's, we're gonna, we should expect a loss of $4 billion per year. We are overdue for earthquakes in multiple locations, as you guys well know, including the Hayward Fault. Earthquake early warning works, it's a proven technology, seconds to minutes worth, um, worth of warning. It's going to reduce the impact and the cost of future earthquakes. Um, just the number of injuries from falling debris. If you recall when we talked about the Northridge earthquake, 50% of the injuries in the Northridge earthquake were due to things like falling steam tiles. So if you gave everybody, let's say, five seconds of warning so that everybody could be under a sturdy table when the shaking starts, you just halved the number of injuries in that earthquake. That's a huge savings. Um, then also the value, you know, if you stop trains from derailing, the, you know, Bath is about to buy new train cars. Each train car costs $30 million. One train is $300 million. Okay, so uh, the cost of building and running it for five years is $80 million. If we just prevent one train from derailing, we've more than paid for the entire statewide system. Um, we have a plan to build it uh, in collaboration, obviously, with the U.S. Geologic Survey, or led by the U.S. Geologic Survey. That's where the number comes from. And there are operational warning systems in Japan, Mexico, Taiwan, China, Turkey, Romania, Mongolia. We are way behind when it comes to implementing this kind of public safety. Okay? So, so what it comes down to is, that in order to actually do this, we need uh, action from legislators to actually commit the funding that's necessary um, to build an early warning system. We've been making progress. I've talked about this legislation. It's a slow process. But I do believe that they will commit the funding over the course of the next few years. So hopefully, let's say five years from now, if we uh, have a big earthquake, you will all actually receive a warning beforehand. All right. Thank you very much.